Welcome to the Rocking Life podcast, Rocking Life After Divorce. And today we have Lisa Marie McGregor. Welcome to the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. It is so much fun to interview people. This is my passion to hang out with people, being this curious detective, just finding out what the life is about. I just wanted to talk a little bit about who you are, begin to discover a little bit about what you've gone through in the divorce and what you do for a living. And here is a short message to my listeners. Every Wednesday night at 7 Central, we have a group coaching for anyone that's dealing with divorce or breakup and that wants help in a group setting. We have Zoom and you can sign up via the link in the bio below. We're usually around 10 people and uh, we have a great community where you can uh, just show up, hang out, ask your questions. And we also have a shorter type of a workshop where we talk about different subjects. And uh, we have recently been talking about how to go from being lonely to having awesome friends. Please join us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Central. Sign up via the link below. And now back to the podcast. After walking the road through divorce, co-parenting and starting life over in your 30s, and uh, your passion about helping others navigate this transition by helping them remove the should have, could have, would have been and start writing the new story. And uh, it's really awesome to get to know and talk with people about this. I usually say this is a navigation, it's a journey, it's what you do day to day. And um, I started the podcast and it was mainly to help other people. You know, going through a divorce was the most difficult thing in my whole life. And to navigate that without help is so difficult to do. I struggled a lot, but I was fortunate enough to get the help fairly early with a counselor, a coach, and a mentor, having awesome friends around me to support me. I just wanted to know, how did you come to a place of acceptance of this new life, this new journey? I think the biggest thing for me was removing all the stories in my head that told me that I was a failure or that... I was taking steps back or that I was less of a woman because I wasn't parenting my daughter 100% of the time. And I realized that those were stories that I was telling myself in, in my head, because when it came down to it, stories like you're a failure says who you're not as much of a mother. Cause you're not parenting 100% of the time says who really, when you start to boil that down, you realize that the story was in my head the whole time. So I've been having to rewrite that story of the truths and tell myself those instead. And that has been my biggest breakthrough. Oh, wow. Yeah. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on in the podcast. It's such an important thing to rewrite your story. You have an amazing life in front of you, but sometimes you have negative thinking, you have negative things that pop up in your head. I think it's important to grab onto that and realize that your future, a lot of times you get stuck with this old programming. I got to know you through your TikTok channel. I discovered TikTok about a year ago through my kids. I have four kids myself and I really love TikTok, really short, compact stories and teaching and uh, entertainment. And yeah. uh, I really like it. So I think that's how we met initially. I just wanted to get to know you a little bit better. You are uh, a mom and a little bit, tell me a little bit more about you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm 37 years old, actually just had a birthday two days ago. Oh, and, wow. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. And I have a 12 year old daughter. We live in Northern California in the Bay area. And I was married for nine and a half years and we have been divorced now for about four and a half years. So it has been a journey. Absolutely. Like you said, now I'm viewing it as that as a journey, not a destination and slowly transitioning into a new career as well. I have been in health and fitness for almost 18 years and through this whole process, started transitioning into realizing that that was a part of me, my, my old me. And I'm realizing that going through this process of divorce, there was so much knowledge that I have gained from situations that I've been in, but then I'm also seeing how there's a lot of women out there who are struggling with some of the same things that I was. And I really felt called to 
transition into being able to help women through this time of life, somebody that I wish that I could have had when I initially went through it. Yeah, I usually say that it's impossible to do it by yourself when you go through difficult things. For example, divorce. Divorce was the most difficult thing I've ever done. And initially my counselor, because I was going through much, so much loneliness and depression, pretty much every single person I interview have, have dealt with loneliness, depression, suicidal thoughts, etc. And to do that yourself, I think it's unwise because to have somebody else that have gone through it before can help you along that journey like you are. If I coach people, mainly men going through divorce, how you do it in a good way and get both a coach, but also mentorship to walk through that in a good way. A lot of times you can get very blind and having blind spots and you make some poor decisions just because you don't have the wisdom of a mentor, somebody that's already gone through it. So what was the most difficult thing going through divorce for you? Like I had mentioned in the beginning was the stories that I was telling myself in my head. So I was the one who chose to walk away from the marriage. And as with any situation, it's way more complex than what the naked eye sees at surface value. There's so much more depth to that. Prior to asking for the divorce, uh, the day after Christmas of 2016, we had gone through months and months of counseling and separation and all those things for approximately 18 months before that. And I it was hard for me to come to that realization that that is what needed to happen. So I struggled with feelings of feeling like a failure, like I'm a quitter because I walked away from my marriage, feeling also that I was less of a woman or less of a mother because I was then now transitioning into parenting my daughter 50% of the time. And I really had to look at where those stories were coming from. and. One of the quotes I like to say is, what you focus on is what you find. So when I was looking and saying, well, everybody else is still married. Well, everybody else still has their kids. Well, everybody else will. Those are the things I was saying to myself. That is what my mind was going to work to find, to show me and prove that it was true. When really the, the honest thing is, is that no, not everybody is, you know, there is a lot of people that are going through divorce. There's a lot of people that have their children 50% of the time and look how much they're thriving. Look how much of a wonderful mother or father they still are. And so I had to go through and reprogram the brain. And then my mind started focusing on that instead. And it was like, no, I'm not the only one. And yeah, if she can do it, I can do it too. And that has been my biggest realization after the divorce. Yeah, I went through a lot of shame myself. My parents stayed married until my dad passed away. And, and being in a church that talks so much about staying married, and then I felt like a failure because I didn't stay married. They didn't talk much about the divorce. And uh, I dealt with that for probably a couple of years, really struggling with that. But then by starting to talk about it, that was how I got out of that. I, I read a book by Brene Brown. I don't know if you know Brene, but... I love her. Yes. Yeah, she's a shame researcher and uh, she talks, I've talked about this prior in the podcast. I started to talk about my divorce in, I was flying back and forth to Sweden all the time. And uh, by talking to other people and starting sharing about the divorce, the shame just dissipated. And I realized it later on that this shame is gone. What happened? And uh, it was because I, shame wants you to keep quiet about whatever you're shamed of. But whenever you start sharing with other people about it, it just, uh, it's gone. So it was very, very cool. I um, got to know you through TikTok and then I checked out your Instagram and you had some very interesting posts that I like to talk about. And uh, one uh, post you had said, when you find yourself after just being a wife, what do you mean by that? So I think a lot of times when you're in a marriage and especially when you become a mom, your identity so becomes about that role and there is nothing wrong with it. I still very much believe in marriage. I still want more children, all of those things, but I got married so young that I really didn't really have that time to find myself and really know what that meant. And 
I got so consumed in just being a wife and what I thought a wife should be, which in my mind was take care of everybody else and then put yourself last. That's what the honorable thing was to do. And I thought I was doing the right thing. And that included my daughter when she came along. I got so consumed in being a mother. I loved it and I still love it. But I was like, who is Lisa? Who is she outside of the wife, outside of being a mother? And so when we did eventually divorce and then I was parenting my daughter 50% of the time, I realized that, okay, this other 50% of the time that I have, let's, let's really dig into who I am, what uh, things really light me up, who, who am I? And that's when I really dedicated that, that time alone to that. I like that. Um, finding myself, a, a lot of people throw that out, but I don't really know. A lot of people, I don't think they know what it means and uh, what lights you up. I like that uh, statement uh, and trying to being a, uh, being a person to try to find yourself. What is, what does that mean to you? Finding myself and it's like loving yourself. These, these things that a lot of people talk about. Well, let me start by saying that when I used to hear that term, I would just be like, oh my gosh, roll my eyes. <laughs> I would just be like, barf, what does that even mean? Like exactly. I was one of those people. So if you've got somebody listening right now, who's like, all right, I'm about to turn it off. Don't do that yet. Listen up. Yeah. So I really started getting into the personal development, listening to podcasts such as this, and really starting to understand what that truly meant. So like I said, what lights me up? What were my hobbies? What were the things that I used to do prior to getting married? And even outside of that, as at the time, a 32-year-old woman, what do I, what do I like to do? What interests me? And then also too, alternatively, what are the things that trigger me? What are things that, that I don't like? What are situations that I don't want to be in and rediscovering, you know, friendships and rediscovering even my relationship with God, rediscovering that as well, because I had really put that to the wayside as well. That is so awesome to hear. I usually say, uh, divorce can be the best thing that's ever happened to I I'm not for divorce. It was a most difficult thing, but it can be a wake up call where you've been in a relationship. It might have been struggling, whatever reason for it, it doesn't matter. But afterwards you can actually turn this into the best thing and, and turn your life around to become this amazing life and to rediscovering friendships, rediscovering God. A lot of times you do open up in these difficult situations for outside help and i think that's one of the most important things and in my relationship i tended to isolate myself in the family i had the family but i had less and less friends because it was so busy with everything it was having the kids uh, running around working a lot so i sacrificed having my own friendships and that's something that i rediscovered after the divorce And that was thanks to my counselor that said, you know, reach out to a couple of friends and share what you're going through and these hurts that you have. Because I had a really hard time talking about my pain. I was so ashamed of it and I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. But then I started reaching out to a few friends that have also gone through divorce and I felt that they could really understand me. And that was crucial. And I really share that with anybody that's going through a divorce. Find a, f- a couple of friends that you trust to have them help you through this because it's so difficult to do yourself. I, I love that what you said about to finding yourself, to find that whatever lights you up. I started playing tennis again after taking a 30 year break. And what a great way to find friends. Yeah. I, that's my, my best place right now. I love that. I used to play tennis in high school, but then I just quit uh, because I, I, I just played so much and then I just quit. And now I picked it up two years ago and uh, we're actually going to play tomorrow again. I play quite a bit and I have such a great friendship. Uh, now, how, how did that, when you say rediscovering friendships and God, talk into that. So 
friendships, I've always been a very extroverted person. I'm a social butterfly. That's just who I am. And when we did get married, we moved out of state for a job opportunity for my husband at the time. And so we, all of our friends and family are all in Northern California, which is where I reside right now. And this job opportunity landed us in Washington state where we knew nobody. There were a handful of people. He had a college friend that lived nearby and we were very involved in our church and made friends there. But for the most part, I was pretty isolated. And again, I was very consumed with just being what I thought was a good wife and a good mom that my whole world was him and my daughter. That was it. So I realized that after the divorce, I wanted to rekindle some of those friendships that I had. My close girlfriends from high school, my friends in not only just my friends, but my family, I'm very close with a lot of my cousins. And I rekindled some of those relationships. And I realized how much I need friendships outside of my partnership. And I realized before I moved on again, that I needed to be really solid in who I am, have my own life outside of myself. So that way, when that person came along, then we would just compliment each other. But I was not making him my entire world. I have my world. He's got his world and we come together and make each other better. I think that's awesome. I think that's uh, crucial in a, in a successful relationship that you do have separate friends as well. Of course you want to have joint friends, but I think it's very crucial to have these other friendships. So it's not about, like you said, in a relationship, if your husband or wife, and your kids is everything, then I think it's, it becomes in a way you, you need to have friendships to support you and, and having that part of it. I really like that. Yeah. Now you mentioned triggers. What do you define a trigger as and what triggered you in your first relationship or in your current relationship? Is there certain things that you know that triggers you and how do you handle those type of things? Well, at the time, again, when I was just so consumed with being young and married and as a mother, I let a lot of things slide. Things like what I, like what I talked about, having, having friendships, the way that I was spoken to, always putting what I wanted, things that I wanted to do on the back burner and always putting everybody else first. And I realize now that when I started to slowly wake up to those things, that's when things really started to become tumultuous in my marriage is that when I started demanding some more respect or some, you know, more me time and being able to spend time with people, that is when things really started to unravel with us. And I realized that that is something that I will never let go again. And that kind of plays into what we were just talking about too, is having a life outside of your own prior to being with somebody and maintaining that even when you are in a relationship, because that is so incredibly important to have a life outside of your own. So those were major triggers for me. I was very codependent in my relationship and having boundaries is crucial. That's a lot what you're talking about, just setting boundaries. And that's so healthy in a relationship because it's going to create the respect in the relationship when you have boundaries and you say, okay, this is okay, but this is not okay. And by somebody not overstepping those boundaries, that shows respect and you build on the relationship and trust. Now, another couple of questions here I saw that I really like. One thing that you wrote here is, what if our setbacks are actually paving the way for our biggest Mm step-ups? Talk into that. Well, this kind of goes into too of how we write the story in our head of how life is going to go without even realizing it subconsciously when we're young, we write the story that we've got to graduate from college and then we've got to find the love of our life, buy the house, get married, have the baby. And if it doesn't go in that order or if something gets stopped up along the way, we tell ourselves that we're a failure, that we're doing it wrong. When I went through it, those of course were stories I was telling myself. And I'm realizing now that even though I took a couple steps back, which for me meant I had to move back in with my parents for a little while. I hit rock bottom financially. I, we had to move out of the house. There were so many things. And in my mind, I was like, these are major. I'm taking all these steps back. I'm in my mid thirties. I should be moving forward in life. 
but here I am moving back. But I realized that I had to go through that to then step myself back up. And from a perspective of faith, I really believe that a lot of times God needs to pull us up and by the roots and really get to clean us really well to then move us forward. And regardless if you have faith in Jesus, like I do, or if it's just, you're acknowledging the universe is just somebody else in charge. You kind of have to go through that rebirthing process to then move yourself forward and looking at it that way. Or even on a broader term, like life is happening for you, not to you. If you can look at it that way, yeah. it helps you in the thick of it. And I know it's hard. <laughs> it's hard when you're like, I'm living with mom and dad right now. And all my other friends or have houses, which, you know, is not the truth, but you get stuck in that self-loathing kind of, you know, mentality. But then if you can get out of that and realize that everything is happening for you, it really helps. And I can definitely say that I would go through it again. I don't want to go through it again, but I would go through it again to be where I'm at with the lessons that I've learned. I've heard that quote uh, before. I totally believe that life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. And if you can have that mentality uh, that when uh, difficult things happen, it didn't happen to me, it happened for me and see it as a challenge, whatever. Another post I wanted to talk about I had to make you uncomfortable, otherwise you would not have moved, and then quote God. I really like that uh, quote, and uh, I totally believe that God sometimes lets us go through hardship to refine us and to get us back on the path that God has for us, because I believe God has given us gifts for a purpose, and I think it's important to understand that these hardships can refine you and to turn you into what God has meant for you. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. How did you figure that out? Is that something that you felt while you were going through divorce or is it something that you discovered afterwards, I guess? Yeah, so my thought on that is that it's easier to stay comfortable and to avoid pain. Yeah. I knew things were not right for a very long time. And I definitely felt God calling me and saying, like kind of slowly starting to wake me up. By no means do I say that God wants divorce. I know that God doesn't want it. However, this may be a little controversial. I also believe that God doesn't want you to be in a toxic marriage where you're not being the best version of yourself and who you're called to be. When you're with a toxic relationship and that can't happen, sometimes things need to pull apart so better things can come back together. And in our case, that is what I was really feeling called to do. And it was uncomfortable. It was painful. And I had to go through all that. But I 100% know that God had my back the entire time because I have never been let down. He has never failed me once. And I've always been taken care of. Is it in the best of circumstances for me? Do I, did I have to move back home to my parents? Yeah, that was uncomfortable to go through the court process and all the undoings and all the stress that comes along with co-parenting, especially in a really like angry, toxic environment. Yeah. It's incredibly stressful, but I also felt God calling me into something else, which is another reason why I had to eventually let go of my health and fitness career, because I felt God calling me into something else. I know people that have faith oftentimes struggle And because they say that divorce is a sin and it is, but I think the cool thing with faith is that God doesn't have a point book where it's like divorce is a, that's a 10 pointer, but you know, judging your point, somebody else is only a one pointer. So you're good. It's all the same in God's eyes. And so I don't think we should live in that shame of being too wrapped up in that we're forgiven. And it does not mean that we are doomed for a awful life. No, we have an incredibly abundant life if we choose that. So that is kind of like goes behind that quote of just, yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable, but you wouldn't have moved unless I really made you uncomfortable. Yeah. And uh, a lot of things changed when I went through divorce. I realized I needed to have God in my life. And I've been a Christian my whole life, but it was more comfortable going to church on Sundays 
but not a lot more. But then I, I started to have a deeper relationship with God and and um, really enjoying it. It wasn't like a have to, it's a want to. And that's very satisfying to have that type of relationship. Uh, you mentioned co-parenting, and I had to go through a lot of difficulty in my own relationship. I have four kids, and I've shared that in the past, but not being able to see my kids sometimes for months, quite a bit of alienation. Initially, I didn't see my kids for many months and uh, really, really difficult. That's a shock for the system where I would, for 20 years have spent all the time with the kids and then suddenly not being able to see them at all. And then now I have a very good relationship with them and we see each other on a regular basis. But uh, speaking to co-parenting, what, what are your both learnings about co-parenting? How does it feel to only have your daughter 50% and how does that affect you and what have you learned about it? Well, in the beginning, I really focused on the time that I didn't have her. So I would be thinking, oh, I don't have her this weekend. I don't have her this time and I would be missing her. And I would, I would really dwell on that. And then I realized that instead, if I could look at it as focusing on the time that I did have her, that really changed things big time. And so what I try to tell other women or other people that are going through this, this type of situation is to focus on the quality, not the quantity, because yeah. while I had her 100% of the time prior to divorce, was I actually present 100% of the time or was I just had her? And the answer is, is that I just had her doesn't mean I was a bad mom or that I wasn't an attentive, but I'm a human, you know, you, I was grocery shopping. I was doing the laundry. I was doing all those things. So I really started to focus on the quality versus the quantity and focusing on the time that I did have her. So a lot of times I would when I was hundred percent parenting, for instance, I would be doing the laundry. I would be grocery shopping. I would be doing other things, just being a human being. And I still do some of those things. I don't want her to come over to my house and think we don't do chores or that we don't do those things. But what I tried to do was get a lot of that stuff done when I did not have her. And then when I did have her, we had some quality time and wow. that really helped change things for me. I think so many parents go through that, uh, either if you're married or if you're, if you're divorced. I know in my growing up, my mom and dad, I know they loved us. They spent so much time with us. My dad was gone quite a bit, mostly home in the weekends and played with us all the time. But then my mom was quite resentful while I was you know, in my teens because she had to take care of us all the time. And I felt that not all the time. I love my mom, but it's like sometimes I felt like she all she did was cleaning and, and fixing and uh, making the house perfect, but didn't spend time with me. And uh, I think that's part of a lot of times being a single mom. I think it's very, very important. And especially maybe here in the US, it's like it's so common with that the woman has full custody and then the dad does barely has any time with the kids. I, I personally think it's probably better in most cases that you have 50-50. I think that's in Sweden, it's more common. That's the most common to have 50-50 custody. Uh, I think it's very important that a child has a very good relationship with both mom and dad and to build on that unless it's you know unhealthy things going on. But that was definitely a, a very difficult thing. I had to look at it that I was thankful that she had a dad that wanted to be involved in her life. 50% yeah. of the time. And when I also looked at it from that perspective, through the eyes of what's best for my daughter, I was actually really thankful. And so that, those were just things that really helped change my mentality from focusing on the time that I didn't have her to what I did. And quite frankly, right now in the fall, she's going to be living with her dad during the school year or the school week. And then I will be having her between two and three weekends a month. And that has been a really hard transition for me, even after going through all the things of changing my mentality, which is why this process is truly a journey. It's not a destination. And so I had been really struggling with that. Of Again, those old stories repeating in my head that 
oh, well now you're going to have her even less. And so you're, you're not as good of a mom and all those things. And I just had to squash those real quick. And I've just continuously telling myself in my head, no, I'm still going to be an amazing mom. I'm still going to be incredibly involved in her life and in her school life, just because she won't be laying her head on my pillow at my house during the school week doesn't change anything. It does not define who I am as a mother. Yeah. Another question I had, what did you learn about yourself that you didn't know? I ask everyone that I know myself. I was able to start opening up about myself, about being vulnerable. Uh, and it, it's so awesome. It totally revolutionized my life to, but I was forced into that. It wasn't something that was comfortable. And it's kind of like what we talked about before that God kind of like brought me through this period just to rediscover me, but also to be able to be open and transparent. And I think it's so, to having people and friends that can be transparent is so attractive too. And that was one of my biggest learnings. But how about yourself? It was something that stands out that you feel like this is something I really didn't know about myself or that you discovered? It was discovering my life's purpose. Okay. Um, I think a lot of times we get caught up in careers or things that we think we should do. And we go to college to be an accountant or things like that. Not to say that isn't significant. We need all those things and we need all those occupations, but life can be so much richer if we can step into who we're called to be and who we're called to how we're called to serve and how we're, we're supposed to use our life. For me, that was really an awakening for me is that I went through all these things to then help pave the way for others to show them that it's okay and they're going to be okay and setting them up with the tools to be able to help them along their journey. I look back and I see how God has always been there in my life. And so when I come across things like that in my life that seem like a closed door and it's really hard for me to accept it, kind of like my daughter living with her father in the fall, I have to look at the bigger picture and think something bigger is at work here. And sometimes I don't always have to know the how our human brain always wants to know the how, but I need to just sit back and trust and go, okay, whether it's God, whether it's the universe, you kind of have to trust that somebody else is more in control of your life and surrender to that. And that it's always working for you. So long answer to your question is that just stepping into my purpose, into my calling of who I was meant to be has been my biggest, biggest realization post-divorce. Yeah. And uh, probably one of the most important things in life, when you get to that position, that's when you really start enjoying life. When you're in your purpose, when you're in your passion and to rediscover, and I talk to my kids all the time about that. What do you love to do? And I talked to my daughter a few years ago, it's probably like three, four years ago. And I, I asked her, so, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And the, she said, dad, I'm still a kid. I don't need to know that yet. Uh, yeah, I know. And then suddenly we, we were watching this uh, Grace Anatomy, you know, the show where you have surgeons and stuff. And then she, she came up to me and said, dad, I know what I want to be. I'm going to be a surgeon. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So she's on that journey now. So she just graduated and uh, she's going to go to initially nursing, but she hasn't really decided yet. But it's, it's pretty cool when, when you find your, your passion, your whatever God has called you to do or whatever you want to call it, to have that burning inside of you. And that's awesome. And I think the biggest thing with that too is learning to accept that there's different seasons of life. Yeah. And so like your daughter, who's really passionate about nursing right now, she may change in like 10 years or 20 years down the line may discover something else yeah. and giving ourselves permission to say, okay, that was a prior version of us, but now we're being called into something else. And I think that it's oftentimes we have, we have it like programmed in our head. I went to school to be a physical therapist. I have to be a physical therapist my entire life, giving yourself permission to pivot and say, there's different seasons of life and things change. And being willing to adapt to that and stepping into where you feel you're called to be. Yeah. And most people change career at least three, four times during their life. I definitely believe that God has a purpose for it. You have the gift and to rediscover those gifts is actually quite fun as well and start using them. Now, when you went through the divorce, was something that you feel that you did incorrectly that you feel like our listeners can learn from to not make the same mistake? Yes. So 
in my case, I did choose to leave the marriage. And because of that, I skipped over some pivotal steps because I didn't think I needed them. And the pivotal, most pivotal step was the grief aspect. I thought because I had just reached this point where I was done. And while that was, you know, good in some ways, there was still a lot of grief that I had to go through. And I think sometimes when we think of grief, we think that means that we have to grieve that person, that I miss him somehow. And that's not necessarily true. I skipped over the step of grieving the life that I thought that I was going to have, grieving the family that I thought I was going to have with him and grieving the fact that I wasn't a hundred percent parent, things like that. And by covering that up, I was realizing that it was showing up and popping up in other places. So speaking more to triggers when I would get a text from him, or I would find myself conversing with him over co-parenting issues or stuff like that, I would get really heated. And I would be like, well, if you know, just basically going back and kind of blaming him for some things and some hurts that I still had. And I realized that why are those things still popping up? It's kind of like weeds. If you, if you don't pull up weeds by the root, they're going to continue to keep coming back. And so I went back and I had to, you know, I ended up hiring a coach when I started going through some of the personal development stuff. And I realized that I had to go back and actually grieve that. And once I did, then I started noticing that my hostility towards him for all those things in the past, I had buried those. It was like, okay, I had pulled them up by the roots. I had dealt with the emotion of it and then I could move forward. And so that is where I would love to be able to help others who are going through processes like that to be able to move forward with things faster. So they don't find themselves in that hamster wheel of continuously reliving that pain and the resentments and things like that, you can get off that hamster wheel and move forward with your life. You said you go back and revisit it, but how does that help you get over it? If you explain a little bit deeper, how, how do you deal with grief? I know myself, my dad died when, you know, 20 years ago, way too early. And uh, I grieved him. I definitely, it was a very, very difficult time in my life, but Divorce was much more difficult for me. It was definitely, I usually say, because if it had so much strife in the divorce, it's been a continuous grieving because of the it coming back all the time. And how do you deal with that? So for me, one of the exercises that my coach had me do was to write a letter to him. And you could be as vulgar, as mean, whatever as you want, because you're not going to send that to him. She had me write out in detail and she said, get in a quiet room, put on some relaxing music. I want you to write out everything, every pain, every, everything that you would want to say to him. And then after that, I took it and I burned it. And it was, there was something symbolic in that, that it was like, I was releasing all of that stuff and loading it all onto this paper, sitting with that emotion There was tears involved in that. It was just like the grieving process of that. Now, for me, it was a quicker process because of how far ahead I already was and kind of where I was with him. Now, that wasn't just a one and done thing. It really was symbolic and it did help me with my anger and aggression towards him. As far as, you know, accepting things like, you know, being a co-parent, part-time parent, accepting that I didn't have the family that I wanted. Those were emotions that I just had to work through and journal daily. It was like things would come up and triggers would come up where let's say, for instance, I was going to a baby shower of a friend of mine who's having her third child. There were some resentment issues in there where I was like feeling those pop up again, where I was like, well, I wanted that family. So journaling out those things as far as, okay, well, where does that root come from? And then just digging, 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 digging and journaling through it. Emotion comes up with that. And then it is, it's like, once you get in through that, then it's like, you rewrite the story and say, remember, okay. Another truth is too, is that your future may include more children, just not now. Yeah. And even if they doesn't include more children, God has a good plan for you. So it just Once I journaled that out, realizing when those emotions would come back up, rewriting that story and reprogramming the brain to remember the truths of what those things are. And that helps me cope and deal with it. 
journaling is definitely something I discovered during uh, going through a divorce. I had journaled on and off in early in my life, but definitely did not do it on a regular basis. But that's something I, I discovered and I still journal all the time. And uh, it's really helpful when you put your thoughts on paper. It's a power in that. Even if you never reread it, it's just by writing, it becomes clear. And I think it's truly helpful. Now, coming towards the end of the podcast, I always ask a last question. If you have a listener right now that was in your situation, that's really, really struggling in the divorce and going through a lot of loneliness, depression, suicidal thoughts, uh, whatever, struggling with uh, not being able to be with the kids. What's the first steps to start taking in this situation? Or what would you say to that person? First of all, that you're going to be okay, that this is not the end. There's so much life still ahead of you. And you're going to go through this process and you're going to see on the other side how this particular season of life needed to happen in order for you to be where you're going to be eventually. I would say the first step would be to get yourself support, get yourself around other people that are walking the same road that you are. And TikTok is actually a great place for that. So I know you had kind of talked about TikTok and some of the older people maybe not quite fitting in, but I think that that's also a stigma that, yeah, it may have started with girls dancing and doing all these dances. I don't do those dances on mine, <laughs> but it's also so informative because there's so many people that are so vulnerable on there on so many different yeah. subjects that it helps remind you that you're not alone, which is why I decided to be vulnerable, open up about my experiences and what I'm going through, because I want other people to feel that way and to feel that they're supported. So that is a huge thing is to surround yourself with other people that are going through that. And then also to get some one-on-one -on -one help, whether it be with a coach, whether it be in a support group where you guys are all moving forward together, that was so huge for me. And I didn't do that until four and a half years in. So halfway through my journey is when I did it about two years in. And I realized that I wish I would have done that in the very beginning. Share about what is it that you're going through it together with other people? Where do, you, where do you go to find these people? Because I think that's crucial to do. How did you find these people and how does it help you? So for me, I had gone on to Facebook to find some divorce groups on Facebook. What I personally found is there was a lot of negativity in some of the ones that I was in, a lot of ex bashing and things like that, which is what led me to opening up my own Facebook group. I wanted to create an environment where people knew that they could come and be vulnerable, but we also focused on moving forward and not the ex bashing, not living in that hamster wheel that I was talking about, about steps on how we move forward. And so that- And what's a group called? It's called the Unplanned Chapter. And uh, where can people find more information about you and what you do? So I can be found with the same handle, the unplanned chapter on Instagram and TikTok, and then as well as the group on Facebook. Unfortunately, this is only for the ladies. I did make it just for women, but uh, I know that there's lots of support out there, even for the men as well. It's been such a pleasure to have you on this podcast. It's been a pleasure to hang out with you, to ask these questions and get to know you and, and your journey. I really hope the best for you and for the future. Thank you to you as well.